Welcome to In Pursuit. Everyone should be in pursuit of something. Join us in our discussions today with inspiring people who influence our lives and energize our understanding of what's possible. Stay in pursuit while we welcome our host, Robert Pascuzzi. Good morning, good morning, good morning. I'm so excited today to welcome everyone, all of our listeners, to another edition of In Pursuit. And today, we're really pumped to have a very special guest Les Norman, a good friend of mine. Matt, take it away on your intro of Les, please. Awesome. Yeah, Les Norman is a syndicated sports radio host, a TV analysis, an author, and a motivational speaker. Norman also used to play baseball for the Kansas City Royals during the 95 and 96 seasons as an outfielder and pursued baseball heavily from a young age. Rising from the ashes of poverty and childhood abuse, Les defeated the odds and rose to prominence by earning a junior Olympic medal playing Major League Baseball. Along with his syndicated sports radio show, Breaking the Norm, heard weekly, his high-energy presentations inspire others to break through, push forward, and become not just what they want to be, but what they never imagined they could be. Les, my man, how are you? I'm good, buddy. How are you doing, man? It's good to hear your voice. Likewise. I'm fantastic. This is kind of fun, you know? I'm, I'm, I'm used to sitting in the other seat, so thanks for being on with us today. <laughs> Yeah, I'm used to sitting in the other seat as well, so it's, uh, it's kind of nice to be on this side of things. All right. Well, hey, um, we've got some really good stuff we want to run down with you, and, and um, before we jump into the more current, relevant stuff, would you do a favor and take our listeners back? I want you to explain, because you have such an inspira- inspiring story um, from, from your childhood and, and how you use sports as an outlet and really a conduit to get to where you wanted to be in, early in a, you know, earlier in life. Um, can you kind of take us back and, and explain, you know, how baseball was, uh, was an outlet for you and how, how it helped you transform your life? Sure. Absolutely. Uh, and, and thanks for that uh, great question. Um, yeah, growing up, it wasn't like I was a big baseball guy. I mean, it was early, but I wasn't three years old throwing the baseball around the yard. I had a, a dad that was an alcoholic and, and very abusive and my actually my love of anything was more math. I, I loved math. I loved uh, if it was early second grade. I was I was teaching math to fifth graders and and it, books. Everything in books just really got my attention and and reading a lot too. But one day I came home and heard my dad uh, screaming and yelling, and so I'd had enough. Uh, dropped my books at the door, grabbed my glove, grabbed my bike, and and rode down to the baseball field because I remember after school and then approaching summer seeing some guys that were playing guys that were in in my class wasn't very good at it i had a good arm but uh so i just went down there they didn't let me play right away but i think what i saw was a sense of belonging and finally when one kid didn't show up uh they asked me if i wanted to play and so i played and and really fell in love with it developed a passion for it and so i had my mom sign me up to play it was it was something that at first was an outlet for me to get away from a very troubling, anxiety-ridden, fearful home and turned into a passion where now I could do both. I love to play. It was still the escape until, you know, 12 years old when I came home and my dad left and I never saw him again. But um, eventually that passion from from outlet to passion, passion to profession, uh, that's that kind of the whole cycle of where I am today. Right, right. Awesome. And, you know, I'm thinking about your self-concept and because the concept of what we're able to accomplish is so important uh, in terms of what we're willing to go for and and not to go for. Can you Mm -hmm. tell me, was there a, can you, when you look back, Les, was there a time uh, in your life where your, your concept changed to the degree that you, you saw a future in baseball in that you know, I, maybe I'm going to play at the college level or maybe it was at the college level thinking, you know what, I can take it to the next level. I I could be a professional. Do you remember a point in time where your concept changed dramatically about what was possible for you? I remember the exact moment. I remember the smell. I remember where I was standing. I remember the visual, everything. I was, I had always wanted to be a professional, but as a little kid, I wanted to be a professional like I wanted to be a cowboy, a doctor, and an astronaut. I mean, it's just something that you did and something that you said. Right. And it was, again, you hang out with friends and passion and all those things. But um, in high school, I was pretty talented as I grew, wanted to play college ball. I had those aspirations of being a professional. 
but went to a small school and didn't really understand. And so I received a scholarship to play both baseball and football at the College of St. Francis in Joliet, Illinois. And then right when practices, when winter practices started my freshman year, we were at this old National Guard armory at 5.30 in the morning. So you've got these, these hard tile floors with dust all over them and batting cages on the side. And we had a coach that was throwing these orange rubber kinko balls up in the air at one end of the court. And we had to sprint as outfielders and dive onto this hard floor. It was hard <laughs> as concrete, right. but you slid because there was so much dust on it. Mm. And, and we, there was no chance that we were going to catch these balls. I mean, he was making it impossible and he was getting on us like, hey, it's max effort, max effort. I don't care if you catch it. It was max effort. So I excused myself to go to the restroom, went to the bathroom and came back. And I remember standing in the lobby area before I went back in the gym. And, and this thought hit me. Look, you, you've been saying to yourself and to anybody that would listen, you want to be a professional athlete. But you've never had to work this hard right here, right now. Mm-hmm. ever in your life than right here. So it's time to put your money where your mouth is. Either you need to stop doing this and go do something else, or you need to buy in and give every single thing that you have and see where it takes you. And I, and I had some good success. I'd already won a, a junior Olympic gold medal at this time, and I'd already had my scholarship and all my high school stats to boot. But it was at that moment when I made that decision that everything clicked for me and I got better at a, at a rate than I never thought I would never. I mean, I never even thought about it. And uh, from that's when it really took off and, and the professional aspirations really started to get serious. Right. We, you know, you use the word uh, passion. Can you tell the listeners the importance in your mind of finding uh, a, you know, a passion in your life, the, the way to express who you truly are, I mean, your God-given talents and abilities, how do you see that and how important is that to you in your life? Passion for me is everything. I mean, passions have developed and, and there have been different different passions that have come and gone throughout my life, but passion isn't just something that you're good at. Passion is something that, you're, that God has given you the ability to do. You're willing to do whatever it takes to pursue it, and when obstacles come, you don't quit. You look at it as something that's going to make you better when you get over or around those obstacles. It's, right. it's something that you can be good at, but it's also something that you can make other people around you even better. You have something to give to other people. Passion is what fuels you as you wake up in the morning. I mean, my family fuels me. My family is my passion. Mm-hmm. Radio and, and speaking to others and encouraging others is my passion. Those are things that I literally can't stop thinking about throughout the course of a day. And so, yeah, those are God-given abilities, but they're also something that fuels your fire mm-hmm. and, and allows you to feel like you have something to provide the, the, the people in your sphere of influence that you can help others find their passion. So it's just something that you live and breathe and you can't stop thinking about and it propels you forward. Why do you think people? Why do you think people suppress a passion or the expression of a fuller a life, so to speak, something that is deep down, maybe bubbling up in them that they want to go for, do, be, have? Why do you think, in your mind, why do people suppress those feelings? Bob, that is a great question, and it's probably the best question, and I only have one answer for that. The majority of people don't pursue their passions because they're afraid to fail. They're afraid that mm-hmm. what people might think of them. They're afraid that I'm going to put all this effort and waste my time. They don't believe in themselves enough. They don't believe in others around them. Whatever it may be, it all to me boils down to fear. Right. I mean, it was like the, the first time I faced Randy Johnson, who's seven feet tall almost <laughs> and threw over 100 miles an hour. Oh, my God. First, four times, yeah. Yeah. first wow. four times I faced him, I walked up to the plate thinking I, I have no chance. And you know what? I had no chance. I was afraid. Mm -hmm. But then the fifth time I faced him, my thought was, I'm going to hit a line drive back through your skull. I don't want to hurt you, but I'm going to beat you here. And ended up getting a hit and stealing a base and scoring a run and all that. So the bottom line is, is that people are afraid to fail instead of willing to do what it takes to continue to pursue it and use little aspects of failure to propel them forward. Right, right. That's so awesome. Well said, my friend. And 
and then we stay stuck, right? We stay stuck yeah. because of of self limiting doubts or beliefs that that aren't based in reality, typically, right? They're just stories we've made up in our minds that prevent us from yeah. moving forward. So well said. Um, here here's something I want you to touch on. I know we've talked about this in the past. I've 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 got three boys now. They're a little bit older, but they've all went through youth sports. Les, tell the audience what has been your experience with youth sports. Um, I mean, in other words, do you find parents, unfortunately, living through their child? Could you uh, could you share your thoughts on that topic? Yeah, the, ma- the majority of them do. And it's usually when you go to a soccer game or a basketball game or a baseball or softball game or any kind of sport, you know, football, wrestling, you name it, and you see those parents that are yelling and screaming and, and beating down the kid, whether the whether the, the athlete is receiving it and pushing forward and, and they like hearing it or they're they're just cowering in fear. Parents that do those things and there's so much of it out there right. that they're they're wanting to live through their kids because they didn't pursue their passion or they feel like they were handed some kind of raw bad deal. And so they're going to get their kid there and live through their kid. And, it, and a lot of times it steals the passion from their own children and their own athletes if it's a coach that isn't coaching their kids. And so um, it's really a shame that if they feel like we got to discipline and pursuit and yell and scream and push, I mean, pushing, yeah, is great and challenging and, and helping kids get better in that way. And, and hard work and discipline are a big part of it. But you can steal passion from kids in youth sports by trying to live through them and pushing them too hard. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not the the guy that is super soft and, oh, it's okay. Let me get some tissue. It's okay to cry. I mean, everything needs to be age appropriate and, and build your kids and your athletes through it. But living through them is stealing passion and joy from kids and pushing them further away from their own gifts, not, not allowing it to, to grow. And obviously that chips away at their self-concept. I mean, their, their self image of themselves and, and, and erodes their confidence. Um, I mean, you have two boys. What, how do you handle, let's say, uh, you know, they had a baseball game or they had a sporting event and maybe it was a rough day for them, right? Maybe mm-hmm. they struck out three times or they, you know, things just didn't go that well. You jump in the car, you're on your way home. Tell me how you handle that situation. What would you say or what would you not say? And what would you recommend in that situation, in other words? Well, there's a couple of routes I take. I mean, if it's a really, really bad day, like maybe they struck out a few times, left a lot of guys on base, made an error, something like that, they're already dealing with the failure of it as much as possible. So right. uh, the first thing as, as a parent and their head coach is I'm going to say, okay, do we need to wait a little while to talk about it? Do we just need to talk about where would you like to eat? What are we going to do this weekend? You know, you want to go, you want some ice cream, go play basketball. <laughs> yeah. Let's, yeah. let's go do something different. I mean, when, yeah. And when they were like seven, eight, nine, it was ice cream. Now it's like pizza or wings or something like that. Mm-hmm. So, uh, that's going to be discernment on my part. But when we do talk about it, I'm not going to phrase it in a way like, well, why did you make that error? Because you're just pointing out and really magnifying the fact that the the spotlight becomes on the failure. So my question is going to be, okay, so, hey, it was a rough day. Remember, let's be encouraging and understand we all have rough days, but how are we going to use that to be better not because I want you to be the best baseball player ever, but because I want you to be a good teammate. Your teammates are watching how you handle adversity. And how is today going to help you handle adversity in every other area of life? It's not about the baseball game. It's just about growing and using your gifts and abilities. And I'm always going to end the conversation with, look, I love you because you're my son. You had great effort today. Things are going to be difficult some days, and then other days you're going to have a great day, but we're going to stay on an even keel. God created you to do great things, and your value is not based on whether you strike out or hit a home run. Your value is who God created you to be, and your value is that you're my son, and I love you regardless of that. So let's not get stressed. Let's just learn from it. Let's get better. Let's work hard, and tomorrow's another day. Right on. Oh, that, that's so good, Les. Right on. I, I can really appreciate what you're saying. Looking back, we can all do things differently you know as we look back but um that was so so well said and great advice to some of you parents out there that have younger kids um 
I want to talk about breaking the norm for a second, Les. Here's my question. How long did you have to hold the idea or the image in your mind of creating this platform um, for breaking the norm? You know, I mean, that didn't happen overnight. And sometimes mm-hmm. I think we lose sight on on goals that we set for ourselves. We might put a date on it. And sometimes things, and not sometimes, often things don't happen when on the timeline that we want. Um, and that doesn't mean it's not going to happen. It just means that, that it hasn't happened yet. So sometimes we understand we're, we're being prepared, uh, for whatever it is that we're, we're wanting to aspire to. Can you tell us the audience, uh, how you made, you know, this come into being in in your life and how long did that take? And what advice do you give to people that are going for a big goal like that? Right. And thanks for asking that question. I appreciate that, Bob. And look, the, this is a sense where one passion fueled another, because when I had retired, I was asked by former Royals great and Royals Hall of Famer Jeff Montgomery, the great closer. Um, he was part of, he's part of 810 and the ownership group. And he asked me just to come on. I had retired and uh, been retired for a few years. And he just asked me to come on to, to lend my quote unquote expertise of maybe analyzing a game on the Baseball Tonight post game show. And so I was listening to the radio station more. I like sports radio. And so uh, I love breaking down games. Uh, I've, I've always been an instructor of, of youth and, and been gifted to see what's good and maybe needs improvement on a kid's swing and seeing as a coach. So, but, but then as I listened more, I understood that there was a lot of negativity in radio. I mean, it mm-hmm. was people were listening in because of the failures of other people. And it's this weird thing that as human beings, a lot of times we tend to allow ourselves to feel better because we put ourselves up against people that may be having rough times or something like that when we, we should keep our judgments in the mirror and how we can be better ourselves and work hard and pursue our own passions instead of climbing on the back of other people that are down. Right. And so I just decided, my wife and I were talking about it, uh, the, the radio station at Union Broadcasting had an opening of doing some shows. So I did not have a passion of pursuing a radio program. Like I said, I've been gifted of the exhortation, encouraging other people to be their very best. That was my gift, and I found a platform within radio. There was availability, so mm-hmm. I did it. And you know, Bob, I wasn't very good at it at the beginning. I, I wasn't the best radio host. I, I didn't understand the business. I didn't know how to operate the equipment. I had some great people there that helped me through it. I didn't listen to my first few shows because they just were not great, but the content was still there. And that's what continued to fuel my passion. I didn't quit radio because I was bad at it at first. I knew the content was good. And so I studied the the best radio hosts throughout the country. I studied, I listened to podcasts. I studied Mm -hmm. the best sports radio guys. Um, I just did my research and learned and became a student of it while I was using my gifts. And that I, I saw how it affected other people. I saw how people were emailing or calling or on social media, how it was changing other people's lives and inspiring other people. And so I just stayed in it and, and that passion grew and grew and grew. And now here we are over 10 years later, I'm just continuing to do what we do. And now it's not even just sports. We also actors, actresses, people in the right. entertainment industry, Titans in business are people that have had business experiences where they have their passion and uh, something changed in their life and so it's just positive radio on all three of those platforms so it's, uh, it's been fun and, and the passion continues hey amen yeah you bring in some great stuff and i love your show and les what you know routines tell me tell me about your routines i think most successful people they've got empowering routines they've got things that are disciplines they make sure that basically run their days do you you know in terms of routines do you go through any routines when preparing for your shows to make sure your audience stays engaged and, um, you know, and keep them consistently tuning in. I I think so. Yes. I think I agree with that. I think it's super important that you have routine. Now I'm going to take a step back here, at least, uh, in the mind and be transparent with you in, in a lot of years there were, I was good with routine in some things, Mm -hmm. but in other areas I wasn't. And so I kept feeling like, you know, I'm kind of, things are good, but I feel like I'm hitting a ceiling. And so my bride, Kristen, is super smart, amazing common sense. I mean, this woman learned how to design a website in a week and and self-taught herself QuickBooks and 
and she's super organized and she understands. Is. Oh, it's unbelievable. Yeah. She understands focus. Now, remember, as a professional athlete, I just had to get in the weight room and get my arm in shape and do my sprints and eat mm -hmm. right and lift some weights. And then they told me when spring training was. They scheduled the games. They did all those things. But then once you go into business for yourself, it's a whole different story. You've got to be able to pick those habits up. And early on, I was not very good at that. But I decided, you know what? I'm going to submit to my bride in this because we're business partners. So she's always behind the scenes. She doesn't get the glory that I might get, but it, I couldn't do what I do without her. So she helped me understand discipline, focus, routine. I mean, I, 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 my brain was like, if you're watching lottery on TV, where you get all the ping pong balls inside the cage and they're <laughs> bouncing all over the place. Right. That was my brain. You're my trying to pick the was, right one too. <laughs> you know? Yes, exactly. Yeah. And you, and you can't even see the numbers, but my, my, my bride taught me how to reach in and grab the number that I wanted and set it down while all the other ones might be bouncing around and just focus on that ball and get it done and then pick the next one and pick the next one. Now that's when our really things start to take off. And so um, I've learned routine like I did as a professional athlete. And then that ended, I had to kind of relearn it in the business sense. But um, for radio, for preparation, I'm always, I'm studying um, their background. And it's not just what everybody else knows. I dig in and do some research on things. One, that people may not know about my guest, but number two, what part of that bit of information they don't know that the, the listeners are going to be interested in that might apply to their life. Because a lot of times, you know, we see professional athletes, we see actors, we see business titans. I've watched you grow into, I mean, you've always been someone that I've admired, but I mean, I've watched you, you're a great husband, a great father, a businessman, encouraging others. You've been a go-getter since day one. And so, you know, we all have these routines. And so I want to allow people to understand that, look, you can reach this. It right. isn't some big giant chasm because that person's gift that are successful. That doesn't mean that you can't be as well. Don't fear it. Get into your routine. And if you're good at it and you have a passion, pursue it. And so I, I, I'm always doing the same thing on researching my guests. Um, my bride does a great job of getting interesting people to come on the show. And so every day, Monday through Saturday, we, we've kind of got this routine and schedule that we follow along to make sure we're going to be both as successful as we can be. But then I'll close with this on the other side of that. I also make sure that when, when the work day's done and the time is done, now sometimes that goes further, but I've still got two boys that are in the home and right. I'm going to make sure that I get time with them. So I work them out in my gym at home. We still go out and play basketball. We still take rides and go eat and do different things. So and I'm coaching, still coaching my younger son and his team. So it's, it's important to even make the routine part of that so my my children understand that they're more important than anything else i do and i don't miss that time with them that's so awesome so awesome balance we try to find some balance in our lives and it's so important you right. mentioned a couple words in there focus uh is a big one for me less and we've talked about it over the years um and i think for you listeners this is a an important piece of, of wisdom here because i what i find is so many people they struggle because they don't know and they haven't made a decision on what are they going to bet their time and their money on? Because mm -hmm. if we're not focused and we don't know where we're moving forward to every morning, we wake up, we don't have that goal in front of us that keeps the, you know, the burners going, we, we can become stuck. And I've seen a lot of people, uh, just through business, my experience in business, as you mentioned, and other things that I'm doing, They'll get an idea. Somebody will mention something. Hey, you ought to try this. They run over and they do this for a little bit. And then, no, oh, that doesn't work. And then somebody says, oh, do this, try that. They go over here and they do this. And then, you know, so they're dissipating their power. And then what happens is they end right back up at the same spot and they're just stuck and they're not going anywhere. What advice do you give for somebody that is, is just not sure on what they want to do? And they've got this issue with just, starting and stopping and starting and stopping. What do you tell mm -hmm. somebody like that? Great question. Um, first of all, I think you have to, and part of focus for me is streamlining your passion. You know, you find the one or two or three things you're passionate about, and then you pursue that. I mean, I think that so oftentimes we worry, human beings worry about what other people think 
or you figure just because you have a passion and you pursue it, as soon as there's one little roadblock or obstacle or, or first hint of failure, we stop doing it. And therefore we consider that failure. Well, it wasn't meant to be or discouragement mm-hmm. or self doubt. All those things come in. And, and I think you, you, know, you mentioned as well, the dissipation, we talked about the, all those ping pong balls flying all over the place. Mm-hmm. You know, if I would rather be, amazing at one or two things then try to be amazing at 20 things and then I'm not even good at 10 of them you know a lot of times right. if you think think of a dartboard you know mo- most of us have at least at some level played darts before it's one dart where you're trying to hit the numbers you don't stand 100 feet back and use a shotgun and spray it all over the place <laughs> you throw one dart at one number one at a time and so uh, streamlining focus is, isn't just based on Um, It it is what you're good at, but it's also what you're passionate at. And if you can really streamline that and expect failure to come, then that focus is going to be a lot more streamlined and you're going to be willing to do whatever it takes to get to where you want to be. And I'll tell you what, and you can answer this question. I'll throw my interview skills back on you. (laughs) Let me have it. You're you're, You're a passionate guy. You're a successful guy. And you've always seen yourself, I'm going to pursue this. But have you ever thought, man, why didn't I do this sooner? Or have you ever thought, I knew I was going to be successful, but had no idea how successful I could be than I am right now. And then you start remembering, well, there might have been a fear there, or there might have been a doubt there, or might have been just a thought of, well, I can't do this. And, and you wonder, well, I, I should have been doing this a long time ago kind of thing. I mean, a lot of successful people even think that way, but yet the majority of people will never even get 20% down that road because they're not focused. They're too scattered with too many things and they should just have faith in themselves and in their passion and then streamline the process. Right. Yeah. I, that's, that's awesome. And, you know, I spent the last 17 years, as you know, at creative planning with Peter Malouk, my mm-hmm. partner and great friend, and we had an amazing run there, but um, you know, the last couple of years, Um, that I was there, I had a bubbling up is kind of the words that come to my mind. I mean, I just had something inside of me that was saying, you know, I want to move on and I want to express more of who I am, who Robert is. And so I found that, you know, there was a jumping off point. And when are you going to do that? When are you going to move on to the the second half, so to speak? Um, And I think understanding timing is so important and letting things unfold. I used to be really good at pushing things, right? Okay, I'm Mm going to do, I'm going to just go over here. I'm going to make this happen, make that happen. And there'd be frustration because things wouldn't happen when I wanted them to happen. Looking back now, because you know, it's that old Steve Jobs quote, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. You just have to trust that you're moving in the right direction. But looking back now, I see that how everything is in God's timing. And again, I mentioned this earlier in the show that God's delays are not God's denials, you know, and, and right. so many times we get hung up on, oh, things just didn't happen. Well, it doesn't mean it it's not going to happen. It just means the timing isn't right. And so what I had to understand is how to work more with the flow and let things be on God's time. And the more that I've done that and the more that I've worked on me, right, who, who I am as an individual and what I'm capable of and what God wants to use me to accomplish in my life, the timeline, so to speak, of things that are coming into my life ha- has sped up dramatically. You know, and I shared with you, we just wrapped on uh, The Ravine, a movie that's going to be right. coming out uh, based on the book I wrote, The Ravine at the end of 2020. And doing some of these things now and moving into this, this other part of my life that, um, that, I, that I knew was there but back, you know, maybe a couple of years ago, I didn't know how, do, how am I going to express this? How, how is this going to happen? But now that I've kind of stepped into that flow that you're talking about, things are moving a lot quicker. But for the audience, I want to pass this on because the, the purpose of my life, and Les, I know you have a purpose too that drives everything that you do, that I said about 25 years ago was to glorify God by inspiring others and myself mm-hmm. to learn and grow. Yeah. And, and, and what does that look like? Well, now, you know, we're, I'm doing so many different things and you've got a platform and, and that's the main, uh, you know, principle in everything that I do is I just want to inspire people 
And, and that's why we came up with our podcast in pursuit because we're trying to speak and, and motivate people and, and share positivity and what is possible in their lives by talking to people like you, Les, that, that have done amazing things. So to me, that's what it's all about. You've got to go back to what is your purpose and why are you here and what are you doing? Because to me, it's all about doing and being. And, and we right. all have, we all have that platform. So I appreciate you sharing that. Um, I, I want you to, and we talk about, you know, hardships and triumphs and, and things that we have to overcome. I know you've, you've had a lot of that in your life, but can you, can you think of and share with the audience what single moment, do you have a single moment that you look back on that had significant value in changing your life in terms of what you thought was possible? Um, yeah, there may be a couple, but I think one of the biggest ones is that, you know, I talk about my, my dad and, and, and the abuse and with me and my sister and my mom growing up and then he left. And so I was left fatherless at age 12 on. So, um, I held those grudges for a long time, man. I was an angry dude. I was a frustrated dude. Uh, I was successful in baseball, but my fuel was, well, I'm going to show everybody that they were wrong, even if they didn't think negativity about me. I mean, the whole whole purpose was I'll prove people wrong instead of feeling my passion. That started to creep up. So right. when I started to research and find out what my dad went through as a kid and how he was abused and then realized, look, we all get a roadmap. We can play the victim or mm -hmm. we can play the victor. And so my dad gave me a bad roadmap, but I used it as a place, you know, if I want to go to Rhode Island, and I have a map of California, well, at least I know how not to go to Rhode Island. <laughs> right. People think, well, that's a, that's a wasteful map. But look, right. it's helped me be the most incredible dad that I can be to two of the most incredible boys mm -hmm. that I could ever hope for. And so when, when I made the decision, I'm going to forgive my dad because, man, I just I realized that he's gone now. He passed away, was hit by a car a long, 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 long time ago. But uh, it, by forgiving him, it released me of playing the victim, it released me of, of other people. It helped me understand people more. It released me to be the best I could be. And I really think it unlocked the door with, look, God telling me, I'm in control. You are God's best. Don't let your past rob your present of its future. And you're going to do great things. Just get in the game. Just step in there. And I will use the gifts I've given you to bring me glory so you can help other people. And so uh, I think it was that moment of me forgiving my dad that it just unlocked my brain and my heart to do great things for others, but most importantly, to glorify God. Well, wow. thanks for sharing that, Les. That was uh, that's so well said. Because anger and resentment, I mean, when we hold on to these things, as you know, it, it just keeps us stuck and we can't move forward. Right. And I think you have to be able to get to that place where you're just going to let it go and accept, yeah. accept it for what it is, right? Forgive it and move on and do what you can do. And, and I appreciate you sharing that. Um, Absolutely. Man, this has been awesome. Hey buddy, I've got one, one last question for you. Okay. Sure. Um, you know, you've had the ability to reach such a wide demographic and, and um, you know, with your audience and your influence. Um, when you think about all the people, I know you've interviewed a lot of people from a lot of different walks of life. What are some of the people, does, does anybody in particular stand out to you? Maybe one person stand out in particular that was above the rest in terms of just their impact on who they were and, and what they've done and what they're doing that you just saw, thought, wow, you know, I've, I've interviewed some really amazing people, but this one individual really sticks out above the rest. Yeah, I think there's two, and I'll make it relatively quick because I could I could do full shows with both of these guys. But the <laughs> first one I would say is uh, Gary Player, the the world famous golfer from South Africa. Uh -huh. This is a guy that when back when you didn't have charter flights, he used to take his entire family, and I don't want to say like wife and couple kids. I'm talking about a family that you would call an entourage of people. He would take them on planes and buses, and they would stay with families. And he he was a family guy. His family was the most important thing. I mean, even in his 80s, the guy still does 500 push-ups and 500 sit-ups a day. I mean, you talk about routine <laughs> and discipline. 
This guy is a winemaker. He raises champion horses. I mean, he is a, a business mind, uh-huh. but the whole foundation is his faith and his family and everything else comes second, but he keeps that routine. And, and he, he was really so down to earth and he treated me with such respect and honor. And here I'm interviewing one of the greatest golfers of all time, not just of this particular generation, but of all time. And he did it with a humility Mm -hmm. that he didn't see himself as one of the greatest of all time. He saw himself as a man that was blessed to do what he loved to do and to give back to other people. And the second one I would say on the business side would be Dee Snyder, the lead singer from Twisted Sister. I mean, (laughs) this is a guy that, and it's crazy, but this is a guy that grew up, um, his dad wanted him to be a major league baseball player. And he didn't want to be. He wanted to pursue his passion of singing. Uh-huh. And so he decided instead of doing what his, his dad his dad wanted to live through him because his dad wanted to be and he couldn't, so he wanted his son to live through it. But he pursued singing. And in high school, ended up being a multi-award winning singer. Um, right out of high school, started Twisted Sister. And, uh, you know, once that fame ended, he reinvented himself. He rebranded himself. He's been, you know, he was, it was the headbangers ball. He's for 20 years been on satellite radio. Right. He has done rock opera, successful mm-hmm. rock operas. He has uh, produced stage shows and he's even been a voice on SpongeBob SquarePants. The, the, you know, so he's, he rebranded and reinvented himself that once his identity wasn't just wrapped up in twisted sister, he made a decision on what brand he was going to be. And he continues to to do his thing like he did when he was 18, 19 years old back in the Twisted Sister days. So those are two guys that really stand out for me. That's really cool. And, you know, when you talk about reinventing yourself, there's so many people. I've got one more question because this just gave me another idea. I want you to I want you to give your 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 two cents on this. But so many people are going to need to reinvent themselves because of being involuntarily. I like to describe it as being disrupted. Um, um, you know, this virus yeah, that's good. is right. I mean, it's, it's been so horrible and it's a horrible situation for many and many are going to need to, as I said, they're going to need to reevaluate and maybe readjust and reinvent through this disruption. Um, what have you seen in the radio industry less? How is, if any, I mean, how is, what we've gone through the last couple of months affected the radio industry in general. And then um, do you see uh, more people maybe tuning into radio now because they're, they're home, they're online and they have more time. I mean, what's going on in the radio industry? You know, what's interesting. And I think you'd agree with this, with your business acumen that when the first thing with radio is, is that, you know, when, when the economy slows down, people aren't spending as much money on advertising. So when they don't spend as much money, they pull ads from radio stations and radio stations thrive and run their business on sponsorships and partnerships. And so when people pull back like that, it becomes a really, really tough business. Now there might be others that will, will hang on and maybe have good cash flow or things like that. And we're coming out of it and, and radio stations survive mm-hmm. and, and companies survive in that sense. But you have to understand that just because there's kind of a problem, you have to understand opportunity. If you have a mindset where you can see opportunity instead of focusing on the negative aspect of something that you can't avoid or a difficult problem that happens, if you're able to do that, then you can just jump right in and kind of change things. You know, there are 200 ways I can get from here to there, and it all just depends on do I want the easiest route, do I want the most beautiful route? Do I want the one with less construction on it? Do I want the one that I can go to different stores and it's the most practical? I mean, they're all different ways to get to a destination. And so as business people or as people that need to reinvent themselves, instead of focusing on the problems that change or chaos creates, we can focus on how can I change the by using the gifts that I have to see opportunities in this situation. I got to tell you, I've, I've never spent more time with my family during the quarantine and I absolutely love it. I've changed kind of the way I do some things. I'm not speaking obviously because they don't have crowds, but yet I'm doing three or four other things I didn't do before. Right. And so, yeah. So people need to understand it's not always the problems that end their dream. It's a problem that will kick them in the tail and understand if you reinvent yourself, you have no idea 
the amazing things that you can do and the success that you can have if you're willing to see things that way. Everything can be an opportunity if you're willing to look for it. Amen. Amen. Well said, buddy. And, you know, this is a time where it really comes down to the meaning that we attach to the, these events, right? I mean, because That's right. if we're focused on the negative, we're going to find more of it. If we're focused on what could be, right, and and maybe where is the good? Uh, because I, I look at this situation we're going through as a reset and mm-hmm. uh, on, on humanity in general, something that Absolutely. is unprecedented. I mean, we've never seen anything like this. I've, I was talking with Bob Proctor, who's going to be 86 years old and has seen a lot through his years. Um, the legendary uh, human potential coach. And he said he's never seen anything like it. And what it reminded him of was in terms of the magnitude of what we've gone through is World War II. But even he said, and even in World War II, which I wasn't around for, obviously, and you weren't, but even in World War II, we didn't see it affecting the whole world like this this virus has. So it's so important. And I, I appreciate you sharing your perspective on that. Of, of how we're going to come out of this because we are going to come out of this. And the question is, are you going to come out of it stronger with momentum or are we going to use this as a crutch to, to go backwards? So I, I appreciate your thoughts on that, Les. So good. Yeah, absolutely. I, I just think it's, it's a situation where, because again, the word you use unprecedented, will people look at the, the, look at the situation because it's unprecedented and they kind of knew only one way of life does that mean that the way you know things have changed? Yes. But does that mean the way that you know how to do things stays the same and so it's just over? Or will you take the time to see things differently, reinvent yourself, and then get after it? And that's where the success is going to come out of it. People are going to that, that battle through it and make that change. You're going to see so much joy and success if they're willing to reinvent themselves and see things as an opportunity versus a, a tragedy with, with just this is the end of it. Yes. So well said. And, and audience for you listeners, stay plugged in to things that are good, things that mm-hmm. keep your mind on track and things that things that motivate you like Les's show. You can go find out more about Les on lesnorman.com. He's on 810 WHB radio and uh, he has an amazing show every week. Les, when is when does your show air? Can you share that with the listeners? Sure. It airs two in, in the Kansas City metro area. It airs uh, Tuesdays at at six p.m. It was uh, it got bumped to four a little bit because of all the information with COVID coming out. But the, the consistent time is on our FM side, ninety four point five FM, ESPN Kansas City. Tuesdays at six p.m. and then Saturday mornings at seven a.m. on Sports Radio eight ten. And then all of on my radio page on my website lesnorman.com slash radio. We'll have all of my podcasts on the radio page there. All right. All right. Awesome. Les, my man, thanks so so much again. This was a blast. We could talk forever, but we're going to wrap it up right here. And I appreciate you so much, okay? And tell Kristen and the, the boys hello for me. Absolutely. Your family as well. Thanks for having me, bud. Okay, buddy. Take care. And all you listeners out there, go have a great day. And remember, stay in pursuit. This has been another special edition of In Pursuit with your host, Robert Pascuzzi. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed our program. And remember, everybody should be in pursuit of something.